have the next set of fellows, whoever gets the last slot gets the best advertising. <laughs> so thank you so much. Those words are very meaningful and intentional for me. Also, I will tell you that I have three first names. Sophia, Maria, Ahmed. <laughs> so it's all been taken care of. <laughs> Um, I really want to thank the Rachel Carson Center and everyone here and all the fellows and the students because this experience has been not only valuable but memorable. We've created friendships, we've created networks, and there's been tremendous enthusiasm and I think that the spirit of the center is unparalleled um, through uh, academia and its fellowship scope. So I think you, you've managed to create a team of people who are not only great fans, but will be coming back and doing it again, especially considering that some of us are now committed to writing a manifesto, which will be handed on from class to class. Um, so today I want to talk about leadership. It seems as if uh, the larger and more systemic the problems, the less leadership there's available. Yet as the climate crisis, crisis worsens and the man-made problems we've created become more severe, leadership will certainly go a long way toward providing us with a new path forward. Given that the problems are now overwhelmingly global, it is international leadership that will be needed to mobilize the world community. There is no need to lecture you about the climate crisis and our entrance into the Anthropocene. A term meant to show that human activities can now alter the planet's system. It would be like preaching to the choir. And I know everybody loves Latour, so I have a Latour quote for this. My book project seeks to identify new possible partnerships that could provide the necessary leadership as we enter into uncharted waters. While we have all been conditioned to understand the outcome of doing nothing, what we call business as usual, namely storms, droughts, floods, disease, hunger, to name a few, we're having great difficulty imagining a world that will have to rethink the covenants on which we built human civilization, especially in its modern version, which seems to be morphed into a uniform construct across the globe. Now Simon Dalby poignantly noted that politics is not now just a matter of institutions, sovereignties, governance, arrangements, parties, movements, leaders, and states. It's now unavoidably a matter of cities, pipelines, technological innovations, and discussions about the future configurations of the planet, the new material circumstances wherein humanity has become effectively a geological force, requiring, which requires a much more fundamental rethinking of the geo and geopolitics than most analysts have so far contemplated. We are changing the planet, that's clear. Politics are changing because of this. And solving this kind of Dalbian geopolitical challenge still requires, at its core, political leadership and action. In this quest for leadership in the Anthropocene, I propose that collaboration between the EU and China could become our best hope to confront both the climate crisis and the challenges that lie beyond. Why these two countries, you may ask? Am I purposefully ignoring the U.S.? Also note, I'm calling the EU a country, for lack of a better term. Uh, am I purposely ignoring the U.S.? Why would a U.S.-China collaboration be more appropriate? Why not a turpentine collaboration? The U.S., the EU, and China. Some might even ask, China, really? They can barely breathe in China. They're practically destroyed the environment already. These are all valid questions, of course, and while at some point the idea is to bring the entire world community on board, it is vital to see which actors, by working together, can jumpstart the process now. At the Agent Orange Conference, Ken Feiberg said, we ask too much from the courts. We expect too much from science. They can only say and do so much. The rest, meaning most everything, is politics. Politics is not about the math. It's about perceptions. It's about rivalries, stories, suspicions, common history. It's also about people, their personalities, their strengths, their visions, and how they impact their time. Politics matter, though they remain both volatile and highly unpredictable. First things first, why not a U.S.-China collaboration? Aren't they, after all, the biggest emitters? There's no doubt that these two countries are a big part of the problem and need to be part of the solution. However, that doesn't mean that they can jointly lead by example and provide a credible path forward. 
To begin with, while the U.S. government has recently begun to project renewed energy in dealing with the climate crisis, the political realities in the United States have not sufficiently changed, warning us not to become overly optimistic by official declarations. From the outset, it has been the United States that has blocked any meaningful international agreement uh, on the reduction of carbon emissions. The climate debate is highly polarized in the United States, and the Congress has consistently repelled any attempts to set targets or standards or taxes on fossil fuels. The shattered dreams of activists, the fierce opposition of special interests, the reigning mantra of energy independence, traditional exceptionalism and isolationism all continue to form a unique American narrative. This mixture of denial and foot dragging spilled over into the way the world has perceived the global process for dealing with climate change at an international level. It has given other countries the perfect excuse to posture and delay while the big guns drag their feet. Then, the U.S.-China relationship from the outset has exhibited an underlying rivalry that is only strengthening as the PRC gains superpower status. As far back as the Nixon administration in 1968, the United States government had argued that an isolated China was a more dangerous opponent than one engaged in global institutions. Nixon did not want to see China operate as a destabilizing force in international affairs, and this was his principal motivation for opening up relationships with China in 1972. His view was shared by subsequent presidents, Carter, who normalized the diplomatic relations, Ronald Reagan, and George Bush. The first significant bump in the road came after the tragic events on Tiananmen Square that shook Western public opinion in 89 and put the cultivation of bi bilateral cooperation on hold. Later on, however, Bill Clinton's administration supported China's accession to the WTO. The presidents that followed up until today have continued to engage China, but that does not mean that the spirit of competition and suspicion doesn't underlie these interactions. While engagement is often sought, the U.S.-China rivalry is alluded to rhetorically for both domestic and international consumption. In his State of the Union speech in 2013, for example, President Barack Obama attempted to push renewables in the energy mix by underscoring the competitive nature of the U.S.-China relationship. Four years ago, other countries dominated the clean energy market and the jobs that came with it. We've begun to change that. Last year, wind energy added nearly half of all new power capacity in America. So let's generate even more. Solar energy gets cheaper by the year, so let's drive costs down even further. As long as countries like China keep going all in on clean energy, so must we. He didn't mention Europe anywhere, did he? In the State of the Union speech in 2014, he was again drawing competitive comparisons to China by declaring that, for the first time in over a decade, business leaders around the world have declared that China is no longer the world's number one place to invest, America is. On the question of human rights, furthermore, the United States has been vocal about political dissidents, religious freedom, and the status of Tibet. U.S. rhetoric on these topics is an irritant and a source of friction in U.S.-China relations. U.S.-China rivalry in both the economy and geopolitics is the buzzword in Washington and is echoed in Beijing. While the United States has officially declared its pivot toward Asia, both militarily and financially, China under Xi Jinping hasn't remained idle either. It's leaning toward the West with a variety of bold new initiatives that are catching the world's attention. China's recent initiatives to build a new Asian infrastructure investment bank, seen as a rival to the World Bank, the IMF, and the Asian Development Bank, and to reimagine and rebuild the Silk Road, offering a Chinese notion of the Chinese dream in Central Asia and beyond, has fanned geopolitical tensions as these book covers clearly show. In November 2014, Obama and President Xi, Xi Jinping addressed the problem of climate change during their summit in Beijing. It took the world by surprise, although their respective teams of experts had been negotiating for a long time prior to this announcement. 
Clearly, the two largest emitters, who are still both heavily dependent on coal, will be crucial actors in finding a way forward, first and foremost because of the size of their economies and the energy required to run them. The two presidents issued a statement declaring their intent to take on responsibility for their country's part in the climate crisis. However, the declaration itself revealed more about the U.S. intent to revive the past bipolar power structure while containing the growing rivalry with the PRC through peripheral, peripheral collaboration. This does not bode well for the future of the climate or the planet. There was no vision in that declaration. There was no attempt to bring in the respective allies or acknowledge the work others like the EU had already done. It was a laundry list of emission reducing schemes that lacked the bite to make any kind of effective change. Therefore, while the challenges of climate change and the environment may seem to be an important and attractive area of US-China cooperation, it is inevitably plagued by the overall geopolitical rivalry that has increasingly become the frame in which cooperation and engagement take place. In the view of some Chinese experts in pushing for cooperation on climate change, the United States is in fact looking for another way to contain China's rise. That's what they think. Before its economy far surpasses that of the U.S. This pervasive suspicion held by experts such as Yu Hongyan of the Shanghai Institute for International Studies are not uncommon in China, especially given America's record in the climate change negotiations and its own rhetoric on how a binding agreement would negatively impact its growth and its economy. These issues are but a preview of why it would be unwise to sacrifice climate action on the pyre of the U.S.-China rivalry because that is exactly where such a leadership paradigm would lead us on on the particular front. Now, why would the EU be a benefit? Here, the reasons are many folk, starting with the most obvious. Despite Obama's recent enthusiastic pronouncement, it is the EU, not the US, that has a proven record of commitment in greening the, plan the planet. Europe's involvement with climate change policy has evolved over distinct periods. The formation and formulation phase of the late 1980s to 1992, the Kyoto Protocol negotiation phase from 92 to 2001, the Kyoto Protocol rescue phase from 2001 to 5, after President Bush announced to the world that he wasn't going to ratify this treaty and the protocol, and the current period of implementation, Kyoto Protocol follow-up, and push to reach a new international bonding agreement. Certainly, the European Union has defended its commitment to a legally binding and rules-based approach to international action on climate change while implementing an ambitious action plan to diversify its energy mix, promote emission reductions, and resource efficiency in its own territory. It has used regulations, taxation, outreach programs, standards, policies, laws, directives, media, and politics to create a narrative of economic opportunity while continuing to protect the ecosystem. In fact, it's clear that in the time after Kyoto, the EU has starkly differentiated itself from the United States in policy ambitions, stringency in scope, and has legislated broadly vis-a-vis -vis climate change. Already in 2007, the European Council embarked on a binding plan to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the Union. Known as the 2020 targets, the plan mandated 20% reduction of greenhouse gas emissions below 1990 levels by 2020. It also set a target of a 20% increase in the share of renewable energies and overall energy consumption, including a 10% binding minimum target for transport fuels and a 20% cut in primary energy consumption compared to projected levels through energy efficiency improvements. These goals were backed by legislation across the Union. The EU also launched and supported the EU ETS, Emissions Trading System, the first such comprehensive uh, emissions trading scheme. It adopted regulations on emissions performance for cars, and it encouraged and facilitated new technologies and renewables. 
Nothing similar happened in the United States over the same period. In fact, President Obama had to resort to his executive powers to effect change through the Clean Air Act for stricter emission standards for transport and stationary emission sources. Even today, Europe forges ahead. Having now mapped out its more ambitious 2030 goals for the Union as a whole, while countries like Germany are aiming for broader energy transformation known as energy benefit. On July 13 of 2015, the European Council adopted the legislation that is necessary in order for the EU to formally ratify the second commitment period of the Kyoto Protocol. Clearly, Europe is demonstrating that its commitment to climate action is backed also by a larger philosophy of development and life in the Anthropocene. Why EU-China leadership could work? There are a number of reasons why EU-China leadership in the Anthropocene could be effective. The EU, in describing its own foreign policy objectives, supports a multipolar world, the importance of cooperation through international institutions, and adherence to the rule of law. China, as an emerging power, shares Europe's views on multipolarity and working through international institutions to help maintain stability and cooperation worldwide. Until now, China had maintained a stance of non-interference in the internal affairs of other states and has strategically avoided antagonizing other industrial powers to focus on its domestic development. Nonetheless, this has already begun to change. And as I always say, if you ask a question enough times, you'll eventually get an answer that you may not like. China has begun to reassert itself in Asia and abroad. Though strong development aid, through strong development aid programs in Africa, South America, and elsewhere, much like the EU, that is in fact the largest donor of development aid in the world. According to those closely monitoring China, Chinese politics, the President of China is personally invested in matters of foreign policy. He's not only traveled extensively already, but he's invited many foreign uh, visitors in his own country. Yet, the Chinese president has also come to, ter has to come to terms with pressing domestic realities. China today is already the world's second largest economy and the largest consumer of oil on the planet. In just under 50 years, China has radically transformed into a global economic powerhouse. This transformation, begun by Deng Xiaoping, has come at an astonishing cost to the environment and the well-being of its citizens. Um, a fact that can no longer be ignored. Rhetorically, the Chinese government acknowledged the problem about three decades ago. Establishing the State Environmental Protection Committee in 84 and the first Environmental Protection Law that was formally issued in 89. After the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development in 92, China was one of the first countries to formulate and carry out a strategy of the sustainable development. Since the 10 5 year plan, which was 2001 to 5, the government increased the emphasis and goals vis a vis environmental protection and energy use in its planning process. Yet little changed. A decade ago, the government once again pledged to tackle the air pollution, access to clean water, and food safety. Today, pressure to deliver on these commitments is mounting, and rhetoric must turn to action. This it was reflected in the 12th five-year plan and will continue to stand out in the 13th five-year plan now being drafted. This will be one of the greatest challenges for President Xi Jinping because bringing millions of people into the middle class each year through high growth figures will not be enough to maintain political legitimacy. The health risks to citizens by the heavy smog on saving water and problems in the food supply are only growing and so is the realization and discontent that this kind of environmental degradation has gone far enough and must now be reversed. What is happening today is that the state of China's environment is beginning to poison the country's economy and this will adversely impact investment that is still playing a central role in the nation's growth. There are a number of areas where the government is seeking to make an immediate impact. First, environmental regulations already existing in the books need to be tightened and enforced. Monitoring enforcement in the regions has been challenging for the central government. We think that it's also well centrally planned, but then everything goes to the regions and nothing happens. 
Secondly, there's an ongoing rethink taking place about where industries should be located. Up until now, the coastal areas of China have been rapidly transformed and industrialized, but there is now a plan to shift some of this industrial capacity to the inland. Third, urbanization continues at very high rates. While this puts pressure on cities, their infrastructure, and the quality of life, urbanization does pose an opportunity to create more sustainable models of city planning aiming at the creation of smart cities, green cities, where changes can be made on the existing infrastructure and at large. According to some statistics I have, 1% of the only one, okay, 16 out of 20 most polluted cities are in China. And 1% of these urban dwellers, 1% of 560 million people, now have clean air by the standards of the European Union to breathe. This not only would allow for close cooperation with the European Union, whose expertise is unrivaled, but also for the implementation of new green technologies and sustainable practices, taking advantage of China's centralized planning structure. In terms of governance, the members of the European Union may be mature democracies and free market economies, but the Union does provide its European partners with a level of central planning that allows for coordination of its 28 states. China's unique model of centralized planning and one-party governance is coupled with a continually liberalizing economy. In China, while political demonstrations may not be condoned, there has been increasing civil outcry over environmental issues, and there, the government has allowed society more leeway to express its frustration and to voice its demand for change. I've talked about this extensively with Victor, who's our resident expert on um, China. Increasingly, segments of Chinese society are asking more vocally for the enforcement of existing environmental regulations and for cleanup efforts to reverse the damage already done. In addition to these commonalities, both Europe and China share long historical exchanges that go back to the time of the creation of the Silk Road. Clearly, the EU and China represent formidable international actors with a combined population of 1.8 billion, increasing in economic interdependence and shared interests. For the President of China's recent trip to Europe in the spring of 2014 had included a component of a historic visit to EU headquarters, which underscores both the strengthening relationship and the desire to build upon and expand ties beyond trade agreements. There is already an ongoing dialogue in place vis-a-vis -vis the climate crisis with the EU sharing its best practices and strategies with its Chinese counterparts, thus providing the platform for further collaboration on this front. The European Union and China formed the strategic partnership in 2003 and that is built on the initial 1985 EU-China Trade and Cooperation Agreement. The ground is already set for the promotion of an ambitious agenda to fight climate change. The EU and the PRC have introduced three pillars of high-level exchanges, the High-Level Strategic Dialogue in 2010, the High-Level Economic and Trade Dialogue in 2008, and the High-Level People-to-People Dialogue, which is also going to play the pivotal role. In 2012, the two powers underscore collaboration opportunities in the document describing the nature of their 2020 um, agenda for strategic cooperation, highlighting the emerging green sectors. The EU has also undertaken to facilitate the building of China's emission trading market. They already started with a pilot program and are quickly expanding to other cities in China. And when you say pilot program in China, you begin with 250 million people. So the pilot project was 250, and now it's going to 500 million. Um, the EU is also, so yeah, the EU has helped them with this, and they're working together to build low-carbon cities, communities, and industrial parks, thus controlling greenhouse gas emissions. Although the building blocks for such a partnership are already there, much needs to be done for both entities to fully absorb the potential of such collaboration. As China asserts itself, on the world stage expanding ties across the globe, it still remains caught up in the affairs of its own neighborhood, and of course in the narrative of the simmer, simmering rivalry with the United States, especially after the latter's declared strategic pivot. For the PRC, the U.S. rivalry doesn't only pose a security threat in military terms, 
or an aggressive economic competitor. It also poses a deep political threat to the regime, offering the lure of the democratic process to an increasingly robust middle class clearly on the rise. These realities could be an additional reason for China to meaningfully deepen its relationship with the European Union, which expresses its views and projects its power in a very different manner than in the, than the United States, which often seems more heavy-handed and aggressive in exporting liberal democratic values and principles around the globe. Working closely with Europe on the climate crisis may be just what China needs to escape the push and pull of the self-fulfilling prophecy of its inevitable clash with the United States. It will also allow it the opportunity to retrace its steps and find how to more efficiently and sustainably provide for its citizens without plundering the planet's resources. This kind of initiative could be a godsend for the EU as well. Although the EU has done much to move forward toward the decarbonization of its economy, to weed sustainability through its policies and laws, and to champion a binding international agreement to deal with the climate crisis, the EU has lost the opportunity to make all this work become its central vision for the future. It has been bogged down in an internal dispute within the Eurozone that will not be resolved by pinching pennies and institutionalizing austerity as the new norm. It needs a dream, an optimistic vision for the future, and a quintessentially European. Climate action, the protection of the environment, and the quest for a meaningful narrative for the Anthropocene provides a perfect, fresh storyline for Europe. Working together with another major power to achieve this kind of transformation would only add more value and purpose to the venture. Now, of course, in every budding relationship, there are hurdles. Forging a bolder and deeper EU-China allowance requires rethinking on both sides. While China views the EU as a powerhouse of technology and innovation, as well as a critical trading partner, it does not perceive it as a geostrategic competitor. So they don't think that they're that important. That's what it really means. They're not as powerful. The ongoing EU debt crisis in the eyes of policymakers in China serves as an indicator of the EU political weakness and perhaps decline. And while it was once thought of an alternative, as an alternative to US dominance, now this belief has lost its momentum. Europe's hesitation or inability to create a stronger political union doesn't allow it to be seen as a global player with a clear voice in international relations, though Europe manages to wear different hats at different times pretty successfully, I think. Apart from these constraints, opportunities remain plentiful, and the possibilities of further exploring this burgeoning relationship still abound. There, there is, furthermore, a growing interest in academic and policy circles for new research to understand EU-China diplomacy, both traditional and soft, and the assessment of the effectiveness of the current strategic partnership. Having spent a decade of my life in the public sphere, as a policymaker in both good times and crisis situations, I still believe that politics will show the way forward. As Connie Hedegaard said, who is the former EU Commissioner, oh, there we go, for climate action said in September of 2014, during a period of continuing recession, the height of the Russian-Ukraine crisis, the outbreak of war against ISIS, all of which were dominating international headlines and distracting politicians uh, from longer-term challenges, why is it so vital to focus on climate? And she said, some voices doubt if this is the right time to focus on climate. With crisis raging from Syria to the Ukraine and from Sudan to Afghanistan to name a few, shouldn't we first deal with these imminent threats? And her answer was also simple and disarming. Well, the World Meteorological Organization's report last week said that global emissions are still rising and that climate change is already here, adding further instability in an already unstable world. This is why we need a global framework to tackle climate change. It's my sincere hope that though Europe and China come from very different starting points, they could travel together on a path to stewardship that will be absolutely essential in the years ahead. Thank you.